Computerized telescopes have incredible potential for us astronomers. Perhaps you are interested in buying one, or maybe you recently have and just want to make the most of your investment. Well, in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you some important insights that any beginner should know to ensure that they get the most out of their purchase. So to begin with, I do just want to briefly walk you through choosing a computerized telescope. So let's just say you're interested in buying one. Well, it's important to know that there are in fact different types of computerized telescopes on the market, each of which are designed to observe different things. And it's essential to ensure that you set your expectations up front. So this is also important if you actually bought one. Let me walk you through the different optical designs. The first is refractors, which utilize specialized lenses that make them a favorite for deep sky space objects like galaxies and nebula. The pros of these are that they require less maintenance, typically, and provide sharp, high contrast images. The cons of these are that they can be a bit more expensive per inch of aperture, and they are generally heavier, especially in the larger sizes. Then we have reflectors. Now, in contrast, these are more popular with larger and brighter objects like the moon and planets because they use mirrors that provide more sensitivity to all of the wavelengths. The pros are that they offer more aperture for your money, typically, and they but the cons of them is that they require occasional maintenance, such as collimation, and they tend to be a little bit bulkier. Then you have compound and hybrid telescopes, and this is one of them. So this is the Celestron Nexstar 127 SLT. So Schmidt Cassegrains and Maxitov Cassegrains, this is a Maxitov Cassegrain, by the way, they combine lenses and mirrors. Now this design makes them versatile for both planetary and deep sky observing. In terms of pros, they are generally more compact and portable. As you can see, this isn't the largest telescope in the world. The cons, they can be more expensive and have a narrower field of view compared to reflectors. So you'll be seeing essentially less of the sky at once. So as I say, my 127 SLT is a Maxitov Cassegrain, for reference. But that's just one part of it. The next is the aperture, which we need to consider as well. Now the aperture, or the diameter of the main lens or mirror, so imagine that in here, is crucial. A larger aperture gathers more light, allowing you to see fainter objects and more detail. So you always want to look at the aperture of the telescope you are considering. The higher the aperture, the better your chances of observing deep sky objects. So you need to think about what you want to observe. Now also consider that the best scopes are considered to have at least five inches or 125 millimeters aperture. Next, you need to consider the optics coating or quality, I should say. High quality optics are important for clear and crisp images. Look for telescopes with good optical coatings that enhance light transmission and reduce reflections. Right, so now I want to talk about setup because that's very important as well. So once you've purchased your telescope, it's been delivered, you will need to set it up optimally. So for this, make sure you follow the included instructions. But here are some general quick tips. The tripod, it's so important that you pull all of the tripod legs out equally and make sure that they are straight and firm. You need to make sure your telescope is level on a flat surface to avoid issues with tracking. So many telescopes like this Nexstar have an inbuilt bubble level and that helps to ensure that you are on stable ground. You also, <clears throat> excuse me, want to make sure that every element of your telescope is screwed in properly. So if I just show you here, everything is screwed in properly. You don't want anything to fall out because it can break and uh, get damaged or be scratched or whatever if it's not in tight enough and it falls out or it's just, you know, it can have uh, impacts on your views as well. The next thing to consider is your battery. So that's, in terms of this telescope, that's housed in here. So as you can see, I've got uh, AA batteries in there at the moment. I would advise that you consider getting a rechargeable battery pack. As you can see, I've got batteries at the moment, but I do want to invest in a rechargeable battery pack. The AA batteries are great, but they're not going to last forever. And at the same time, it's going to get expensive. So a rechargeable battery pack is great to power these computerized telescopes. Now, some common mistakes with computerized telescopes. So here are some I'd like to kind of suggest that and help you to avoid. Firstly, make sure you take the dust covers off. 
it's really e easy to just leave those on. Um, but yeah, just make sure you take all of those off, but also make sure you put them back on to protect your lenses and your optics. When focusing, I always like to finish by turning the focus knob counterclockwise for better precision. So that's here, okay? This here, just on this telescope as an example. And lastly, leverage the finder scope. That's what it's for. Make sure it's properly aligned uh, with a recognizable object. This alignment ensures accurate pointing of your telescope. Now the next uh, thing I'd like to discuss is the hand controller, which is all part of computerized telescope. So you can see that here. So when it comes to the hand controller, you want to learn how it works, essentially. It will, you will need to program it and you will need to go through certain steps. You need to make sure you, you basically do that. So, and you want to make sure that you enter your exact date, time and location and make sure you run through the alignment process according to the guide provided. <clears throat> Next, I want to discuss the auxiliary port, which you can see here, if I just point to that. So this is really, really good because it can help enhance your experience. So if you are struggling to align or input your details, you can use the AUX port. Now you can connect accessories like a Wi-Fi module to help you with your alignment and tracking of objects in the sky. Next, I'd recommend that you uh, leverage star charts. They can be really, really good to help you identify different star constellations and find celestial objects. There are many free and paid star charts available online or and you can you know you can print them or buy them and have kind of physical copies. Also there's astronomy apps, Solarium, Sky, Sky Safari, Starwalk, they're all great and can assist you in locating and identify those objects in the night sky. In terms of actual using it, you want or you're using your computerized telescope, you want to ensure you have a sufficiently dark sky. So light pollution can really affect what you can see. So use dark sky maps to find locations with minimal light pollution if you have light pollution in your general area. Another thing on observing conditions, the best viewing conditions are clear dark nights with no moon, unless of course you want to view the moon. Also avoid viewing over rooftops or other surfaces that radiate heat. Now in terms of telescope maintenance, make sure that you regularly clean all of your lenses, uh, you know, use a soft cloth um, or, or a microfiber cloth as well, it's really, really important. Avoid touching them, you know, the optics with your fingers, always keep dust covers on when not in use, I've touched upon that already. In terms of storage, store your telescope in a cool, dry place, use a protective case if you're transporting your telescope frequently. Now, one of the benefits of a telescope like this not being too large is that you can kind of keep it uh, erect and kind of get it out when when you want to use it um, the good news is it doesn't take too long to set up and disassemble and assemble so you can always do that but if you can if you've got a kind of dry dark space in your home you can kind of leave it standing for when you want to kind of use it the other thing i'd recommend is that you want to start with easy targets so begin targets like the moon and bright planets such as Jupiter and Saturn. Once you're comfortable, move on to star clusters, double stars and brighter nebula, if your computerized telescope is capable of letting you observe them. Now, there's also another thing I'd like to suggest, and that's filters. So there are different filters you can use. Moon filters will help to reduce glare and enhance contrast when viewing the moon. Planetary filters can enhance details on planets, like using a red filter for Mars, as an example. Light pollution filters help reduce the effects of light pollution for deep sky viewing if you have light pollution in your area. So you can check those out as well. Now, here is something I'd like to kind of leave with. The best thing that you can do is just enjoy your telescope and practice it. The more you use it, the more familiar you'll, be, you'll become with it. Practice using the hand controller, focusing, aligning. It will get easier over time. And don't get too discouraged if it's challenging at first. Persevere and you will find it rewarding, especially when you start observing some of those uh, amazing celestial objects. So I hope this guide helps you set up, enjoy, and make the most of your computerized telescope with whatever one you decide to get, whether you've just got it, or you've uh, kind of recently got it out of the box, or you're yet to set it up. If you have any questions, leave a comment, and I'll be happy to help, so leave them down below. And with that said, happy stargazing, and don't forget to keep practicing. Astronomy is a wonderful hobby, but it does require a little patience.